Hi everyone, my name is Jared. I am a leading teacher at the school under the Disability Inclusion Banner, um, but also part of the wellbeing team. Um, part of what I'm going to present today is going to be a presentation on school refusal and school anxiety. So something that I've often got a lot of questions about from lots of different parents and community members around the school. So we thought it'd be great to put out a small presentation that's ideally gonna be around 20 minutes, just on some really practical things we might be able to support you guys with from a school perspective, but also some practical strategies that you might be able to implement at home to help your little one come into school in a really happy and engaged way. School refusal and school anxiety are two separate things. Um, they can be connected at times though. So there's gonna be information that's going to be relevant to you at either of these categories, hopefully um, through this session. So feel free to skip through the session and pick out the parts that are gonna be the most relevant to you and then go from there. So part of this presentation is going to be going through the following points. So understanding what school refusal and school anxiety is, how you guys can work with the school and how we can help you out. So some of the really practical things that we can put in place from our end, and then some of the practical things that you could put in place at home um, to help your little one with that either anxiety or, you know, it could be refusal at times as well. And finally, the last point is a really important point. So where can you actually go to get some support with these two things? So in terms of some background or some evidence why we thought this might be beneficial for some parents, we've seen a really big increase in this, which um, I know is not going to probably shock a lot of people due to COVID and the impact of the pandemic. But the last five years, we've seen substantial increases of this. So, so much so that there's actually been a recent Senate inquiry into school refusal, um, where they were able to look at it, quite a bit of data and um, work together to, to try and set up a, a nationwide plan in looking at school refusal. Some of the data they were able to capture said that between one to five students um, go through this, um, which is school refusal. However, there's a lot of difficulties with capturing that data because there's a range of different kind of school refusal behaviours, um, including school anxiety. So school refusal can occur throughout a range of different school years. However, there do tend to be peaks and that's often where we're looking at transitional times. So that's children starting school, children heading into high school or potentially moving schools. They're the main peaks that you'll see where school refusal type of behaviors will start um, increasing. Um, so what actually are the early warning signs of refusal? And, uh, and refusal is, I guess, a, a student that's unwilling or unable um, to come to school. Um, so that could be on particular days, that could be throughout an entire week, that could be um, over a term. So there's different levels of refusal. So some of the really early warning signs of this are, you know, students that might be regularly late to school where it's a constant battle each morning to get them out the door in school. Could be a pattern of absences where you start seeing them refusing to come in on Tuesdays, Wednesdays. Um, it could be just tiredness. You might notice that there tends to be a lot more complaints about students or teachers at the school. Uh, they could become disinterested about school in general. They might report a lot of loneliness when they're at school or they might report that they're being teased a lot um, or there's some behaviours from other students that are contributing. Uh, they might be having some difficulty with schoolwork. So they could have the attitude where they're just really giving up and, and not appearing to care too much about their work output. Uh, you know, the older students, there might be some failure to meet school deadlines. You might notice at home that after school or before school that they're going through some massive mood swings. Um, so the anxiety levels seem to have increased and you might finding that the, the students have really, I guess, flipped their lid at home a lot more. Um, or you not, might notice that they're actually withdrawing themselves a lot at home. Um, when they're at school, we might see a really, um, an increase in excessive worry about a parent. So they could st exhibit strong emotions if they're actually forced to go to school. Um, you know, they might overreact when you're asked to, ex when you're asking them to explain situations about school. And in some severe cases, it could be threats of self-harm as well. So they're the early warning signs. Now, if you feel like you're seeing some of those early warning signs, it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, you got, are you about to go through a bout of school refusal? But if you are noticing that over time, you're seeing 
um, a combination of these behaviours, it's worth investigating and it's worth getting in contact it, uh, with the school to say, hey, you know, I'm picking up a few things. I think there might be something going on. So what can cause school refusal? As we said, there's an, a range of different factors that can contribute to it. Um, you know, transition is the peak time, but it also can be from fa family events and major family events. So it could be a separation in the family. It could be a death in the family. Um, but normally there's no single event or reason, but rather a various number of factors that all kind of mix together to contribute to this, um, your child's non-attendance. So some of those contributing factors might be, so it could be anxiety about certain so social situations. It could be anxiety about a specific event coming up. It could be peer issues. It could be previous conflict with friends or, or educators. It could be academic problems. So a student that's really going through some tricky um, or battling with some learning difficulties. It could be anxiety about being separated from family members, which is separation anxiety. Um, or in severe cases, again, it could be some mental health concerns. So what causes school refusal? Often when we're trying to identify the function of school refusal, we look at three different categories. That's not to say every student that goes through school refusal will enter one of these three categories. It sometimes can be hard, a lot harder to judge than that, but majority of the time we can try and find one category that's more prevalent than the other. So one of the functions of refusal could be avoidance. So are they trying to get away from something altogether? So it could be social stuff. It could be an event. It could be, you know, transport. Is it attention? So are they trying to gain attention from a particular person? And this is where we're looking at separation anxiety, for example. So it could be, are they trying to spend more time with mum or dad at home? Or is, it is there a tangible asset that they're trying to gain access to? So is it extra gaming? Is it time on the iPad? Is it more sleep? Um, or is it a new toy that they've just got? Is there something there that they're getting extra access to by staying at home instead of going to school? Once we can try and find what the function is, we can then probably develop a few more individualized supports around that student to hopefully help them settle in and transition to school. So working with the school, what can you do? So what can we do as a school? This is their wellbeing team that I've kind of ticked off here, which is Narelle, who's the assistant principal, myself, who's under the disability inclusion lens, and Will Giorgio, who's under the mental health and wellbeing lens. So I've put us three there because we, we can provide a lot of support for you, but the main person to start off with is your classroom teacher. And why I say that is they're going to know your child the best. Um, and if you're starting to see some early warning signs, touch base with them and ask to come in and have a chat with them. They're more than happy to be able to sit down and go, right, we've kind of seen some concerns. This is what we can kind of put in place. Now, what we look at doing from, I guess, a, a high end and a wellbeing end is we've got a multi-tiered system um, level of supports. So what essentially what that means is tier one level, we're looking at everyone. So these are really preventative strategies that we're putting across school-wide to try and engage the students. Sometimes those strategies aren't as effective for some students as others. So that's when we look to engage some tier two supports, which is like some small group kind of intervention. So it's starting to become a little bit more individualized, um, but there's a bit more of an intensive level of support being put in place. Up at our tier three end, which is where you start looking at um, extreme bouts of school refusal, is our individualized intensive kind of supports we can put in place. And this often will mean that we've got an external specialist working with us to support you um, and the child to return to school. So what can we do here at school? Now, the first starting point I'd always say is get in touch with your classroom teacher. Once we get in touch with the classroom teacher, what we can do is we can set up a student support group meeting which is where we can get all the people involved with your child around a table and we can problem solve. And that could be classroom teacher, um, myself or a wellbeing staff member. And if you've got any potential specialists that are, you're already involved with, get them involved. And what we can do is we can work out, right, what's the function of the behavior, but then what plans could we put in place to actually help your child transition back, in, back into the school environment? 
So part of this presentation I thought it's gonna be really important is to give you guys some practical strategies that you can walk away from this with to put in the back pocket and use when you need them. Some of these you might've trialed before and that's fine, but hopefully there might be one or two new things that you might be able to walk away with um, that, it, that might interest you. So often separation is the hardest at school, so that drop off. So potentially look to involve someone else, whether it's a family friend or another person within your immediate family, such as grandparents or aunts or uncles, and actually have them pick your, your child up and bring them to school. That can be a really clear breakaway sometimes from that separation anxiety. When we're looking at school refusal, this is probably more specific at this point to school refusal, is we need to set some really small achievable goals for your child um, to allow them to have success. So meeting as an SSG, which is our student support group meetings, um, can help with this. So we really want to start small and then build up. When we're looking at extreme bouts of school refusal, you know, for some students, it's really as simple as let's get them back at school from 9 till 9.30 um, and then build it up from there. But that's looking at the extreme side of things. Um, another really practical strategy could be having a friend or child meet them when they arrive at school. So set up one of their best friends to meet you. It might be at the front gate. It might be at the classroom door. It might be at the canteen as they go and have a hot chocolate together. But then that helps with that transition from the drop-off where they meet a friend, get a hot chocolate together, and then you say, see you later. And then they can kind of transition from there. Sometimes if your child's struggling to come in through the door, Chat with your classroom teacher because they might be able to set up a bit of a quiet individualized activity that's organized for them to start with at the start of the day. So that could be something that's student um, interest based, such as, for example, it could be Lego. Say if your child's got a really big interest in Lego and they're struggling to come into school through the door and separate from you, that we might set up a small little Lego station where your child comes in through the door, they go straight to their Lego station, for you know, three or four minutes as, as they settle in and separate. And then once they're finished with that, then they transition and join the class. So that can be a really good, um, I guess, bridge to getting them through the door, engaged and happy and, and keen to be at school. Sometimes doing an activity to build up your child's list of safe people at the school can be helpful. And why I say that is um, sometimes classroom teachers are gonna be busy. Yeah, and in the mornings particularly, they're the most busy time. So um, they're setting up 22 little ones and kind of getting their days all planned out. So sometimes if there's a bigger list of safe people and whether it's a wellbeing staff member or another teacher or an ES staff member, it's someone else that your student, sorry, your child can identify with that they feel safe around. So if they are having a really challenging morning and they might see this safe person walking past, you might be able to quickly stop them, ask them to come and support you, and that might aid that drop off. Um, so it could be beneficial doing that sometimes as well. Um, often we're looking at forming a handover plan with your child's teacher and wellbeing staff. So everyone kind of knows what the plan is and that way you can leave school knowing, right, okay, that's the plan, this is what's going to happen. And that can be part of that individualized activity or it could be a drop-off plan. Um, there are a number of different things that we can work in with a handover plan. So sometimes having some clear visuals for your child to view when they arrive at school can be helpful. What that often looks like is like an individual's timetable. So they can walk in, they can see exactly, right, this is what I've got on for today. This is what I'm going to start with reading, then I'm mo moving on to writing the numeracy. And sometimes they can just remove all the worry about what's next at school. Often if their function of the behavior is to refuse, oh, sorry, is to avoid, then ask for a meeting and discuss what's going on. And what are they trying to avoid and how we might be able to problem solve to fix that. And little things as well with even language. So saying see you later instead of saying goodbye. You know, sometimes the smallest little tweaks can make the biggest of differences. And that's a really quick example that you might be able to do that we're working on here at school as well. So drop-offs. So we know that drop-offs are the hardest part of the drop of the routine when we're looking at school anxiety. Um, you know, we know that this is a really fatiguing part of the process for, for parents. Um, you know, and our, our children, they'll pull at our heartstrings, okay, when we're dropping them off. Um, and they can become quite distressed at times. 
So if you're ever having trouble, please know you're not alone. This is where you can reach out to your classroom teacher or ring the office or find a wellbeing member around the school and we can come across and we can support you with it. Um, and we're happy to problem solve with you as well. You guys know the kids the best. Um, so we're going to refer to you a lot in terms of what are their interests, what are the things that we might be able to do to help them transition, but we can work through it together. Even if you... Um, do one of the really hard parts is getting them from home into school and they're in the car and they're refusing to leave the car, just quickly ring the office and let the office know that you're struggling with your little one getting out of the car and we'll find someone to come across and give you a hand. Um, one of the questions that parents often will ask me will say, what do I do when my child just refuses to let go and they're just clinging on? So my recommendation for this would be have a conversation with your child's classroom teacher, wellbeing staff or sorry, wellbeing staff member about what you're comfortable with in terms of our staff doing to support you in getting that separation in the mornings. So, and please know with this that if we, if there's a stage where we can't settle your child or they're remaining distressed after you have left, we're not keeping them at school. We're going to call you to kind of let you know that and work out a plan from there. So please know that if you do leave and your child is distressed, if they're ever not settling, you're going to be contacted. Um, sometimes with the support, if you're finding that, right, we're not just, we're not getting anywhere this morning. Um, we've been una unable to separate them from you. We've been unable to get them into the classroom then sometimes a reset might work. And by reset, I mean, take them home, have a conversation with the plan and the child knowing full and well that you're going to be bringing them back before recess and we're going to be trying this again. Um, sometimes parents will feel that the child wins if that happens. And that's not always the case because at the end of the day, you're controlling the situation. And if you've made the call that, yep, we're going home, we're talking about it and we're coming back, then that removes the element of them feeling like they've won. Um, so when you take them home, have a really honest conversation and go, right, that did not work this morning. What's going to help when we go back again to try and help that separation and see if you can problem solve with them. So what are some of the things that you might be able to do at home that can help? So this is hopefully some really practical things you can put in place. So the first thing would always be speak to your child and try and uncover what the function of that refusal anxiety might be. So what's going on? Are they talking about anything in particular? Is there something that's coming up that you might be able to discuss with them? See if you can kind of put your finger on what's going on. Often it's easier said than done. Um, so please don't be too concerned if you're not able to get too much from your child. Continue to use that positively framed language at home. So not if you go to school tomorrow, but instead change that to when you go to school tomorrow. So it removes the uncertainty from that language. Establish a really clear morning ritual that includes a specific place where you say, see you later. Um, the reason why we do that is because it, structure helps a child a lot in those situations and it removes the barrier of them thinking, where's mum or dad going to drop me off? Who's going to be there? What's going to happen? What time's it going to be? If it's really clear and structured and it's the same thing every day, it removes those worries. Remain really calm and matter of fact and try not to linger. That's easier said than done once again. Um, and as we said, this is, a tr this is a really tricky process, but once you've said, see you later, it's important that you try and leave as soon as possible rather than prolonging that farewell. Often the analogy is ripping the bandaid off and it's like that at times. So, you know, it's really tempting at times to try and watch your child through another window or to try and watch them from around the corner to see that they settle. But once a child is settled or they begin to settle, seeing their parent again often can just reignite that, that distress and they can go from zero again all the way back to 100. So children really will feel that if their parent is really anxious about leaving, that they'll kind of feed off that and that can also be a trigger for them. Um, so try and make sure that once you've said that, see you later, um, it's out. And if that's not working, that's where we're here as well to support you with it. So just let us know what you're comfortable with and what you're happy with, and we'll work with you to try and um, have that separation. If needed, you can look to provide a potential reward-based system. 
I'd always say trying to make sure the student can accumulate the rewards rather than um, if they lose a point that they lose everything. And why I say that is because if you're looking at a five-day reward system from Monday to Friday and you're doing a tick chart and they get five ticks and they get a reward, that's great. But if they have a bad day on a Tuesday, often the thought process of the child is, oh, great, I can't get the reward now, stuff it. I'm not going to do anything for the rest of the week. And you'll find that Monday will be great, Tuesday they'll have a bad one, but often Wednesday, Thursday, Friday can be tricky as well. Whereas if you've got a reward-based system that kind of goes is based off ticks, yeah, five points, best week ever, you get this, you know, this reward, two points, you still get a reward because you've had two good days, okay, and you don't lose everything. Um, I guess on that, the next point is finding the balance that works for your family. And this is particularly relevant for, say, separation anxiety. So if drop-offs work better for dad, then trial it, um, if that's possible. We know for some families, that's just not going to be possible. But even if it's getting grandma or grandpa involved or the auntie or uncle, whatever it might be, find something that's going to work for you guys. Um, the next point now is just setting up a structured routine. So make it really consistent and follow it through daily. So waking them up, getting them dressed, having some brekkie, brushing their teeth, leaving in the car, you know, going to the drop-off point, just make it as consistent as you possibly can. And that removes the concern about what's next or what's happening this morning for the child. You can probably even put along with that a social story. So I've got a lot of social story templates that I'm happy to provide you with. I'm sure your classroom teacher might have some templates. Or if you do a quick little Google search, you're actually going to be able to find a lot of social stories for free all about that drop-off routine in the mornings. Having a transitional item can really help to comfort or to calm your child. Sometimes it's a bit of paper with maybe mum's perfume sprayed on it. Sometimes it's a toy. Sometimes it's a drawing that you've done together in the morning. Um, parents in the past have used some symbols either on a lunchbox or on a bit of paper or even on the back of the hand or the front of the hand. Um, it's just something that can remind them of you guys as they transition rather than holding on um, and having that separation becoming really difficult. So that's something that you have to pre-teach the child and you have to work through them with, but it has been effective. Um, something that parents have tried in the past as well is do a walkthrough on the, on the weekends. Or this can be really effective even on the holidays before school starts again. So where you actually go and practice the routine step by step. Where are you going to walk? Where are you going to say goodbye? Where are you going to pick them up from? It just can front load everything for the student so there's no questions. The last point I've put here on this slide is a really important one, but if you're finding none of these are working and you're working with us and we're trialing things and it's not working, then my recommendation would always be seek specialist advice. And that would be contacting your GP and asking for an appointment. And that's a really good place to start. So some other things you can, um, you could trial at home. So if you found that the drop-offs are really tricky in the morning and you've been able to, you've struggled through the separation, but then they've forgotten something, take it to the front office rather than the risk is always that if they see you drop something back into the classroom, you've got the chance of it becoming a really distressing event again for your child. Um, so sometimes it's easier to drop it at the classroom and then we'll bring it down to them. If they have a really positive day and the drop-offs worked really well, pump it up. Yeah, talk about all the positive things that have occurred during the day. And then not only that, discuss those same things the next morning. Oh, yesterday we had the best day. Now, remember we did this and how great was that? It's just that positive reinforcement and those multiple exposures to positive things that can be beneficial and just um, allowing them to understand that school's a safe place and it's going to be okay when they drop when they get dropped off. The last thing I've put in there, as we discussed at the start, speak to your child's classroom teacher about setting up a plan if you've got any concerns. They're going to be the best point of call to start off with because they're going to know the student the best and they're going to be able to set up the most um, individualized supports um, that they possibly can. Right, so what if things aren't working? So where else can I go to get some support? So we understand that this is a really challenging time and it's really fatiguing time as well. It can have a big impact on the day-to-day -day life of our parents. Please understand that with this, depending on the severity of the, the separation anxiety or the refusal, 
unfortunately, it'd be great if there was, but there's no golden ticket um, that's essentially going to fix everything. Um, if there was, I probably wouldn't be talking on here because I'd be quite rich and famous somewhere, but unfortunately, there's not. So part of it is going to be a bit of a marathon, not a sprint. And at times it's going to be trialing some things and for those things not to work. Um, at times we might be able to trial some things and we have some success, but it's going to be a lot of problem solving. And that's where I encourage you to reach out and get that support. So understanding that things are going to become overwhelming at times, particularly if we're going through a really severe case of that. And if you're not, if you're concerned about things not progressing, or you're not seeing any results, then my recommendation would always be to reach out for those external supports. And that's where an appointment with your GP would probably be a really good starting point. If you don't want to go down that track, what else can you do? What else is out there? I had a conversation with Beth Sutton, who's um, from Student Support Services, who is a psychologist um, and team leader through the department. Um, and she's able to, she's been able to send through some resources that I've got on these next few slides that could be really beneficial for you. So here's some resources on separation anxiety. Um, there's some really great stuff here, particularly from Raising Children Network, where you can have a bit of a read through and see if there's any bits and pieces that you might be able to pull out and put in place for you. Um, that's going to work for your, your family and your child. Um, we've already discussed probably a lot of them through this pr presentation, but there might be a few extra things throughout the, each of those four links. Some more separation anxiety resources. We've got two different courses here. These are probably more designed for some of the older kids um, because there's actually a student course that can be completed. Um, but they're online, they're evidence-based, and they're specifically for anxiety. Um, it, the brave one, the top one there, there's actually a program for parents to do at the same time as the child. And that allows for that consistent language to be used um, because you've done the program together. There's some really great podcasts out there as well. I've just put a quick little link to one and that's just about separation anxiety and sleepovers. Um, and although it's something very separate, sleepovers, there's still some things that are relevant for transitioning that separation anxiety to school local support now. So where else can you go? I would really recommend looking at Ballarat Community Health and giving them a call if you're struggling with, with anxiety or refusal. They can actually provide six free counselling sessions without a referral, but you'll need to call. I'm not sure of the wait time at the minute, but it's worth reaching out and asking what programs they've got to support your young one um, with these issues. There's also the option of getting a mental health treatment plan and that's done directly from your GP um, and they might be able to then link you in with a psychologist. So I would always recommend calling the psychologist practice first to see if they've got availability as some of them have got massive wait lists um, where you're looking at six months onwards. So um, you may need to ask for a long appointment before that, uh, before that Book, uh, sorry, before you book in with a GP so that you've got a long appointment to actually create that mental health care plan. There's also Federation University Psychology Services um, who might have sometimes a shorter waiting list and I can send through some resources on that as well, but that will be to see a provisional psychologist, so a psychologist that's going through training um, that works with a, um, a professional um, directly. So there are some options there to get some support locally um, to, to help you guys. Here's some resources as well to reach out to. Don't forget about Kids Helpline. It's a very underutilized resource, but it's really been really effective for some of our kids. Um, it's for children aged um, from 5 to 25. If you're ever struggling, your young one's ever struggling, give them a call. Um, have a chat to someone. I've also put some references um, where I've got some of this information from that we've worked really heavily with in the past and some resources that you can reach out and have a bit of a read up on. I've even put the Senate inquiry document in there as well. So feel free to click on that link and have a bit of a watch. There's also another presentation done by BU, I believe about school refusal. If you're going through this and you're really struggling, reach out and have a bit of a look at it. I definitely recommend that. And that brings us to the end of our presentation for um, today. Hopefully, as I said, there's been a couple of practical strategies you've been able to put in the back pocket now and you might be able to utilize at home. One of the biggest takeaways I want you to take from this session is if you're struggling, 
reach out. Um, we've got a wellbeing team at the school for a reason. That's what we're here for. We're happy to sit down with you and go through, right, what is happening and what we can do to support you with it to hopefully aid that transition back into school for your young one and get them back to enjoying school, which is what we want for all our students. I will attach my email to this presentation as well and to this post. So if you've got any concerns, you've got any questions about any of the resources um, or if there's anything you want to ask me, send it through via email and I'll be more than happy to help you out with it. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If there ever is a topic or anything you feel like parents are crying out for at the school, let me know. We'd be more than happy to provide another online resource similar to this where we can give you some information on it from a school perspective. Thanks everyone, have a lovely day.